It is now my pleasure to turn today's program over to Dr. Peter Hurst. Doctor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody, and welcome to the 22nd in our Innovation at Work uh, webinar series from MIT Sloan Executive Education. The Innovation at Work webinar series uh, we use to bring to you uh, insights and the latest research from our faculty who uh, teach in our executive education programs uh, here at MIT. Uh, and I'm uh, delighted today uh, to be joined by Dr. Stephanie Werner, who's a research scientist in MIT's Center for Information Systems uh, Research. Uh, we're going to be talking today about the next generation enterprise for business models for thriving in the digital era. Uh, and uh, Dr. Stephanie Warner, Werner is a, uh, an expert in, in, in this topic. Her current research uh, includes questions like what does a digital savvy board uh, look like and what impact do they have uh, on firms and, uh, and businesses. Uh, and we might hear a little bit about that, but uh, really what I would like to do is hand the floor over uh, to Stephanie now. Uh, and uh, when I've done so, she will talk for uh, about 40 minutes We'll have a Q&A session. Please feel free to ask questions as we go along. I'll compile those questions uh, and put them to Stephanie at the end of the presentation. We'll also have a Facebook Live session after that. Uh, so with that, uh, I'd like to invite Stephanie to take over and uh, take it away. Thank you, Peter. So before I start, uh, I'd like to say welcome to everyone here. And I'd also like to thank our sponsors and patrons. Uh, they uh, fund our research and make all of this uh, exciting things happen. What I'd like to talk about here is research that we've done on the next generation enterprise. Uh, Peter Weil and I, my colleague, have uh, started about five years ago wondering what were, the, uh, what were large enterprises going to do to succeed in the digital economy. And we were specifically interested in digital disruption, the impact of increasing digitization on a uh, company's success. So we describe digital disruption as new entrants, new business models, breaking down industry barriers. And we uh, started by convening uh, roundtables of CIOs and asking them about their most important IT-enabled business transformation projects. We collected 144 of those initiatives, and then we went through and categorized those initiatives, finally coming up with two key dimensions that companies were trying to address as they positioned themselves for the digital economy. So in this talk, what I'm going to do is I'm going to describe some insights, I'll describe some case studies, and a framework for helping you think about what your enterprise should look like in the next five to seven years. So one of the first questions that we asked companies were, what percentage of your revenues are under threat in the next five years? And it's a question that I think you should really think about as you're looking uh, to transform your organization, because that's going to tell you what kind of urgency you have in creating uh, a digital change. When we asked companies, the average revenues under threat was 28%. That was across all industries and across all sizes of companies. This is a fairly consistent number. We found that when we asked boards of directors what level of threat they thought their companies were under, we got on average 33%. We've just done some more research recently, uh, and I think the average is, was 29% in that survey. But if you looked at large companies, and we defined large companies as having more than $7 billion in annual revenues, you see that they described their level of threat as being 46%, which, which creates much more urgency for these large companies than it did for the average company. So as I said, we took these 144 initiatives and we uh, categorize them with the two key dimensions that companies were trying to change on being knowledge of the customer and business design. And I'd like to go into a little more detail. We found that uh, companies did not know who their end customer was typically. They often didn't know, they might know who was purchasing, but they didn't know much more than that about them. So some firms are, um, 
quite advanced and they know not only who their company who their customer is um, but they also uh, know what their customer is purchasing they know what their customer is purchasing from other firms and they know about the decision making process and they know about uh, what kinds of problems that the customer is trying to address. So that was the first dimension. The second dimension is what is the business design? Who has uh, decision rights? What are the choices that companies can make in terms of who they can uh, supply, who they can sell to, how they're distributing their product, um, and all of those other kinds of questions. When we looked at the options along these two dimensions, we found that they fell naturally into four options for the next generation enterprise. The first option is a supplier. And suppliers are companies who sell through other enterprises. You see that even in today's economy, and it's still a viable option for the digital economy. Uh, one of the issues for suppliers is that they don't know as much about their customer because they're selling through uh, other companies, much like intermediaries, um, agents selling insurance, um, mutual funds mutual ver via brokers. Uh, one of the problems with this model is there's a potential loss of power and the core skill here is that uh, typically, unless you have a really great brand, you really have to be a low cost producer with a focus on efficiency, although we do see a need for incremental innovation. The second option is omnichannel. In this option, the company owns the customer relationship. They are trying to solve their customers' problems and they're trying to address life events. Uh, the customer needs or feels like they can go and interact with the company across all channels and they want to move across those channels seamlessly, which means that omni-channel firms are really under pressure to create multi-product, multi-channel um, bundles of services and products. Uh, we see a lot of firms in banking and retail in this uh, business model. The third business model is modular producer. This is a company that is plugging and playing into other companies' platforms. Uh, they are able to adapt to any ecosystem and they have a constant, they need to constantly innovate their product and service. Modular producers uh, are digital, their products and services are digital, uh, and they are a firm that really doesn't operate as much in a value chain, but much more in an ecosystem. The last model is an ecosystem driver. This is a model where you are the destination in your space. You own the platform and you see all of the customer data. You add complementary and possibly competitor products, although we have seen that uh, in latest research that adding competitor products really is a distinctive uh, capability of ecosystem drivers that own the most market share. Uh, the ecosystem driver is really matching customer needs with providers and they're extracting rents from everybody who is on the platform. Uh, if you were to look at the quintessential ecosystem driver, it would be Amazon. Think about your uh, interactions on Amazon. You go in, you search for a product, uh, Amazon shows you products that will fulfill, and it doesn't matter if Amazon sells it or a competitor sells it. And in fact, they will give you a huge array of choices. Once you buy that product, it gets shipped to you, and then you can uh, go online and you can rate the product and you can rate the uh, interaction. Suppliers, we would contrast that with Walmart Walmart often did not know who their end customer was. Anybody could go into the retail store, they could buy the product and uh, walk out without Amazon knowing, without Walmart knowing very much at all about the customer and what they were trying to achieve. Uh, you will see that Walmart is making a lot of choices and changes, acquisitions, 
to try to move out of the supplier and to learn more about their customers. So for instance, one of their new um, uh, initiatives is to have people shop for their groceries online and then uh, pick the groceries up at the store. This allows Walmart to learn a lot about those weekly products and purchases that customers are making and to start to put together a, uh, a picture of who their average customer is and who their particular customer is. Here are four exemplars, and I'm going to go into more detail about each one. For a supplier, Procter & Gamble is a typical supplier. They sell through retailers, and in the past, they did not know a lot about the end customer. USAA is a financial services firm in the United States, uh, and they serve the military personnel. Uh, they are very well known for having constructed life events to help their customers solve problems like buying a car or buying a house. Uh, in the past, those had been uh, interactions to buy a house required that you had to uh, talk to a broker, you had to talk to a real estate agent, you had to get financing once you bought the house, you then had to get insurance. And USAA, in trying to construct buying a house as a life event, is trying to bundle all of those choices and all of those um, uh, steps into a single solution. Uh, modular producer, PayPal is a modular producer. We see PayPal interacting across a number of platforms uh, with many, many companies using it. Uh, it means that PayPal has to be great uh, at interacting with uh, other companies, having its API is very easy to use so that companies can plug it into the platform itself. And then for ecosystem driver, we see Aetna, a health insurance provider in the United States, making a, lots of changes through acquisitions and organizational change to become more than just a health insurance provider. They want to be your place to go for your wellness needs. So in more detail, we've got Procter & Gamble. And Procter & Gamble has 4.8 billion consumers worldwide. And if you think about it, they did not know a lot about which customers were buying Pampers, which customers were buying Tide, um, which customers were buying both of them together, when they bought them, how often they bought them. And so Procter & Gamble decided that they needed to learn more about their consumers. They were still going to be a supplier, but they wanted to be a supplier that had more knowledge so that they could target their innovation to um, creating products that customers wanted. Uh, so one of the things that they did was create web pages, starting with Pampers, Pampers.com, which created a connection to the um, individual customer. Uh, women could go online and put in their, um, their due date. They would learn about the developing baby once the baby was born. They would get uh, uh, coupons to buy Pampers. And Pampers has added things on to keep the customers coming back uh, so that they can learn more about their daily life. So, for instance, while a woman is pregnant, they can come, the woman can come back to the site and see how the baby is developing. Afterwards, besides getting coupons, they can learn about getting, um, about the developmental milestones of uh, babies. And I was just on the site uh, recently, and they have a section now on toddlers. So, this is a way for Pampers for, to learn about um, who has what children, how many children do they have, and how often they're downloading the coupons, which they hope are leading to sales. The other thing that um, uh, P&G did was they decided that they had to learn about their customers using data. One of the damning statistics that they found was that 83% of consumers make purchase decisions before entering the store. And if we think about what um, 
Procter & Gamble has done well. It was shelf placement, end caps, um, providing coupons in the store. And if your, if your customers are coming in and making, um, their purchase, making their purchase decisions before entering the store, that kind of capability is not as important as uh, intervening earlier in the purchase process. So they're using business spheres where they can gather executives together to uh, pull together a wide source of uh, data, and then the, then the executives can make uh, hypotheses about what will drive sales, and then Procter & Gamble quickly stands up decision cockpits so that the executives can see how the hypotheses are playing out and then roll out those decisions uh, to the entire, um, all of their regions. Uh, this is really evidence-based decision making and then really doing a test and learn and an iterative um, way of making decisions and incremental improvements that uh, Procter & Gamble did not do before. USAA, going into more detail, has decided that they are delighting their customers with life events. They are a company that has put their customers' experience uh, first. So uh, along the way, I think the first life event that they defined was buying a car. Typically, USAA got involved in the car purchase process near the very end when their customers would come to them and say, hey, we need car insurance. And if the USAA customer representative did a little probing, they would find out that often these young military personnel had uh, not gotten a great deal, didn't have access to a lot of choice, and USAA thought to themselves, we can do this better. They entered into a partnership with another company called um, TrueCar, uh, and created what they call Auto Circle. With Auto Circle, one of their customers can go online, they can say, they can describe the kind of car that they want to buy, and USAA will then, um, with, it has relationships with dealers, USAA then provides a um, description of the available cars in the area, uh, customers, can then choose the car, the dealer that they want to go to. Um, when I did this, USAA sent me a coupon for $200 to take to the dealer, so I got an immediate $200 off the price that was quoted to me. And then uh, USAA is involved in every part of the purchasing process. They can uh, offer a financing option, and then once you buy the car, they can set up the insurance. They know all about that purchase because they decided to bundle all of these parts of the process of buying a car together to create the buy a car life event. And on this slide, you'll see some other uh, life events that they have. Uh, marrying is a life event. Uh, having a child is a life event. And USAA has thought about its products in that way. Now, to go and and deliver on the concept and really delight the customers, they had to have a major organizational change. At one point, they pulled all of their customer experience people out of the products and put them into a unit called member experience. And it was very large, it was 12,000 people, and it was a significant organizational change. But it was important if they were going to um, really think about these multi-product, uh, multi-channel type of experiences for their customers. They have, now that they've really inculcated this to their member service people, some of those member service people are going back into the products because not every uh, interaction with USAA is about a life event but it's still the way they think about the majority of their interactions with their customers. The third model, modular producer, uh, we see PayPal as being uh, a, a real a company that embodies all of what a uh, modular producer needs to do. They have to be open, they have to be secure, and they have to be technology agnostic. So uh, PayPal um, has a very easy APIs to use so that any uh, company can hook into PayPal. 
They're used across the globe. They're used uh, across a wide variety of companies and industries, and they're constantly innovating. One of the things that we see with modular producers is uh, this need to always be looking at changes in technology, adjusting to those changes in technology, and creating a good experience for the customers because uh, we think that it'll be a race to the bottom if you're not one of the top one, two, or three companies in a space. So this is what a modular producer has to do. They have to be innovative, open, secure, and technology agnostic. And finally, we have an ecosystem driver. Uh, Aetna decided to move from just providing health insurance through employers to employees, which meant that uh, Aetna was really um, had an a intermediary between themselves and the end customer to uh, instead their vision and their mission became building a healthier world. And they wanted to become a destination for healthcare. So they needed to do a lot of um, organizational changes to achieve that. First, they had to really build a platform that would allow them to have um, that would allow them to help their members to lead healthier lives, which meant that they had to not just have insurance information on there, but they had to have information about medications, tools to find doctors, estimating cost of medical procedures. Also, they had to create partnerships with um, people who provided services like uh, training, um, information about recipes and diets. So. If you go on the Aetna website, you're not just looking for health insurance, but you're looking for tools to help you live this healthier world. Uh, then the second thing that they became very good at was making a series of acquisitions that allowed them to know more about their customers. One of those acquisitions was iTriage. iTriage is an app that you can input your, sim your symptoms and it will tell you if you need to worry about those symptoms and if you do, what you need to do. So, for instance, if you're a middle-aged man uh, having shooting pains in your left shoulder, the eye triage is going to say, immediately get to a hospital. Here is the closest emergency room. If you are an Aetna customer, you will also, not only will they tell you where to go, but they're going to give you a map of where to go. They're going to uh, tie into that hospital's or urgent care center's systems. They're going to make sure that your medical records are available, and then they will help with the billing. Uh, this has been very successful. Eye triage has led to 40% fewer medical uh, emergency room visits, so they've been able to look at those symptoms and uh, really target the uh, the customers more toward an urgent care center and this has helped reduce costs and this app has helped them learn more about their customers. So Catherine, I think it's time to do the push poll. We'd like to know what is your target model? Where do you think the source of your majority of your revenues should be in the next five to seven years? And you have four choices, again, supplier, omni-channel, modular producer, and ecosystem driver. And once we have the poll done, I'll show you what our data says uh, in the surveys that we did in 2013 and in 2017. And this looks, um, this is quite interesting in terms of the results. Um, supplier 16%, omni-channel 30%, modular producer 15%, and ecosystem driver 39%. So I'm going to write that down really quick, and we'll go on to the slide. So as you can see here, um, in uh, 2013, when we first did this study, uh, we had 42% of firms were supplier, with 21% in omni-channel and 18% in modular producer and 20% in ecosystem uh, drivers. Um, 
This was interesting to us. We did some analysis on who were the ecosystem drivers, and it turns out that uh, if you were a small company, you were much more likely to try to be a modular producer or an ecosystem driver, which made a lot of sense because these were companies that were trying to, um, they were new, they didn't have legacy systems, and they were typically born digital. When we did the same series of questions on a survey in 2017, we found that suppliers essentially stayed the same, but ecosystem drivers and modular producers really um, reduced uh, the number, the percentage of companies that were in those quadrants. It's very, very hard to be an ecosystem driver, and I'll go into some of the things that you have to do uh, to be great at an ecosystem driver. Modular producers, um, we were surprised by this data because it seemed like there would be uh, more digital products and services. Uh, we think that this is going to be a quadrant where the numbers increase. Um, you can make a lot of money if you're the, one of the, the leaders in this quadrant, but I think that it's hard to be technology agnostic. It requires very good uh, talent. Um, Omnichannel has expanded quite a bit, and we're looking into the data more closely to see if possibly um, a lot of the companies decided that they it was so difficult being an ecosystem driver, but they had learned so much about their customers that they could uh, start by uh, really spending time and concentrating on the omnichannel, making the um, the interactions as seamless as possible, and then perhaps regrouping for another uh, try at ecosystem driver. Um, we looked at financial and other types of performance of all four of these models. Now, what I want you to remember is that all of these models are financially viable. If you look at uh, revenue and growth, you can see that ecosystem drivers dominate. Um, they are more profitable and they have higher growth and suppliers lag. But that doesn't mean that they're not successful. It just means that their potential for growth is typically less than being an ecosystem driver. Uh, modular producers actually do quite well on revenue growth and net margin. Um, again, there are very few of them. I think that that's an interesting quadrant and business model to look at. Omnichannel did great on customer experience and time to market. So in that, um, in those types of more subjective um, measures, um, these were companies that focused on the customer and focused on creating uh, products that customers wanted to buy. And so it's not uh, surprising that we see these differences in performance. If we look across industries, what we see, um, retail has more ecosystem drivers. I was surprised to see that result because uh, Amazon is such a large presence in that, but I am wondering if uh, you can have smaller niche ecosystems. Um, and we saw that manufacturing and service providers were actually lagging and still had uh, many more suppliers than they had ecosystem drivers. Um, we think that there are, there are still a lot of opportunities, but it does mean that if a company wants to be an ecosystem driver, which looking at um, what you're trying to, what your results say, then there are some things that you need to concentrate on. Here's what makes it possible for your companies to change business models. One is you have to know a lot about your customer, so you're moving up on that axis you have to get great information about your customers' goals and life events. Um, this is going to mean doing um, more um, focus groups. It's going to mean talking to your customers. Uh, it's going to tie in to the uh, amplified voice, customer voice inside the company. We see a lot of firms using tools like sentiment analysis and net promoter scores to make the views of the customer known throughout the company. Evidence-based decision-making becomes very important, as we saw in the P&G example. So you need to think about um, 
Are you standing up hypotheses about your customers? Are you iterating? Are you creating uh, A-B testing type of models? And then changing and making decisions based on the outcomes of those uh, A-B testing types of um, interactions. Uh, and then finally, do you have integrated multi-product, multi-channel customer experience? That is important both for omni-channel and for an ecosystem driver. Uh, to change your business design, which is moving to the right, you need to be the first choice in your space. You have to create a destination that customers want to go to, and it's the first place that they think about. When we look at some of our case studies, it was uh, interesting that uh, customers who wanted to make a change in their business model also thought about rebranding. So for instance, Aetna did a rebranding. Procter & Gamble did not do a full rebranding, but they wanted customers to know more about uh, them as a company of brands. So for instance, um, if you look at Pampers now, or if you look at Tide Detergent, you will see that it is Tide, a Procter & Gamble company. Uh, and what, you're, what they're trying to do there, um, while they're not probably moving a play away from the supplier model, they are trying to distinguish themselves and move more toward an ecosystem business design. You have to be great at partnerships and acquisitions. Uh, we are looking at data now that is suggesting that not only are you looking at partnerships that have complementary products, but uh, the great ecosystems, the ones that have the most market share, are also including competitors on their platform. Uh, you need to be able to service enable your core business transactions with uh, APIs. And then finally, um, because an ecosystem driver is the platform where all the data, all the customer data is, you need to be great at efficiency and compliance and security. So uh, you can't say, oh, this is, uh, oh, woe is me, this is too hard. Uh, really, if you're going to be more networked, you have to be cognizant of the data that you're trying to protect and uh, your customers are going to expect this from you. So I'm going to uh, give you a quick case study on how Aetna became an ecosystem driver. Uh, in 2000, they were certainly a supplier. They were only supplying their health insurance uh, through employers, and they started making a series of moves um, upwards. So they uh, created a platform that was an Amazon-like shopping experience. They uh, decided to look at their customers in terms of attitudinal segments. So they created three different types of customers, customers who wanted um, uh, the basic type of health insurance, those who were mainstream, and then those who wanted the best of everything. Uh, they created a 360 degree data view of the customer using things and then also uh, supported by net promoter scores and sentiment analysis. Um, analytics became very important because if you're going to do evidence-based decision making, you need a way to look at that data and then started putting together a portfolio of products and services and health and fitness apps. In moving right, they, um, as we talked about the rebranding, they became an attractive destination. Uh, they really went after acquisitions. So I triage is just one of 15 or 20 acquisitions that they made to give themselves capabilities that they didn't have. Uh, they partnered with health insurance exchanges and then uh, created a set of internal and affiliate APIs. So not all of their, many, many of their APIs are not open to the public. And they became uh, expert on healthcare compliance. So in conclusion, um, I want to suggest that you're coming to a fork in the road. Are you focusing on transactions or are you focused on meeting your customers' life event needs and building a network of relationships? Uh, we think that you should be buying options for the future. Um, think about moving up. How are you going to meet your customers' needs but, and not just sell products? And then moving right, how do you become a destination? How do you become the place that customers think of first when they have a problem. Uh, the capabilities that you need to transform, uh, your infrastructure investment is going to be really important. You need to have a great platform 
where you have automation so the things that are uh, that happen regularly uh, are uh, just taken care of um, automatically. You need to be working in the cloud APIs. Uh, we see in a certain segment, especially in manufacturing, that IP addressable assets are very important. Uh, master data management is also important. Every firm that does this actually has a complete, uh, has a consolidated uh, customer data. You'll need top management support, and you'll need to constantly be thinking about innovation. And finally, changing a business model requires organizational change at all levels. So once you've made the changes, you're going to have to support this throughout your firm with a lot of training and, um, and education, and uh, you need to keep doing that over and over again. The digital economy is exciting and it's rewarding for so many firms, but it's also ongoing and you need to keep reinventing yourself. Great, thank you very much, uh, Stephanie. And while you've been talking, I, we've been receiving a lot of questions through the platform. Please oh, do uh, keep them coming as we just adjust our shots so that I can uh, okay. get here as well. Uh, so please do feel free to keep asking questions uh, on the platform. We'll try to get to as many as we can. Uh, but just to get us started, uh, you know, as you were going through through these examples, uh, one of the things that many people were commenting on was it's quite a hard task to characterize the entire economy uh, in terms of thinking about these digital business models. So as you've been doing this research, are you seeing any significant differences in different sectors, in different markets, or perhaps, you know, different international markets? Are there any sort of different flavors that you're seeing, or is this a universal? This is universal, but there are, there are industry types of differences. So, for instance, we're seeing um, Omnichannel is a um, very popular model for retail and for financial services. Um, I think that we're going to see ecosystem drivers in a number of domains. These domains may actually cross industries, so it's hard to see um, if we're going to have like a home buying uh, industry, but it may be a home buying domain that actually pulls from insurance and pulls from banking and pulls from real estate. Mm -hmm. um, this is still very new. We see a lot of firms talking about how they might become an ecosystem and what is the destination that they want to create. The other thing that I would like to uh, talk about is that in large firms, you're likely to be in all four quadrants. So for instance, if you look at a Fidelity, Fidelity um, sells its funds through brokers. Um, it is a modular producer in that it has uh, services like, you know, calculate your portfolio that can be plugged into other ecosystems. And it is certainly an ecosystem driver in that if you go to their site uh, and you say, I would like to look at my portfolio and then I'd like to rebalance it, uh, you're going to get a Fidelity uh, uh, fund first, but then you're going to get a Vanguard fund and maybe T. Rowe Price. Mm -hmm. And so they've got competitors on their platform. So uh, I haven't seen global. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen any regional differences, although um, I think it's much more industry-based right now. Mm -hmm. One of the questions that, that, that comes up uh, a lot of times is we're thinking particularly about these consumer uh, business uh, data-driven mm -hmm. uh, and customer intimacy kind of uh, businesses is how does privacy uh, affect that and are those attitudes changing? Have you seen in your research uh, any indications of what direction that is heading in? Or as consumers, are we becoming more willing to surrender privacy or are there generational changes happening that there, uh, we should know about? There certainly seem to be generational changes. One of the reasons um, uh, I think Millennials seem to be more likely to uh, trust their personal data with firms. Uh, it's one of the reasons, though, that we said efficiency, security, and compliance uh, had to be a um, had to was a necessity for changing your business design. So customers can lose. Uh, look at the Equifax uh, data breach. Mm -hmm look at the target data breach, customers can uh, become uh, quite angry. It's hard to say how much this is going to affect in the long term, but I, security is going to become even more important. And 
once you know that these platforms actually collect all of your information and mm -hmm. certain companies can see all of it, yes, that is uh, certainly a concern. Um, it becomes creepy though if uh, right. what companies know about you. Yes. I don't. I think the best way that we've seen companies address this is to um, make it have there be a um, a reason that you're getting the data, mm -hmm. and have it be a logical, good reason for getting right. the data. You mentioned their, their cybersecurity. That's obviously a, a question a lot of people are asking about what the implications of some of what we've been reading about uh, mm -hmm. in the press and cybersecurity are for the sort of digital transformation project uh, in the economy at large. You know, are we, uh, is that a deal breaker, do you think? Have we got the infrastructure and capabilities that we need around cybersecurity? Is there something that any firm who's looking at this needs to do as the basic blocking and tackling before they embark on, uh, on one of these transformational journeys? It is the basic blocking and tackling. Um, uh, in my uh, colleague, Barb Wixom, um, her research on data, she has shown that uh, being able to make the data secure uh, is one of the most important things that you need to do before you change your business model. We were looking at it in uh, the context of Internet of Things, but you had to get that uh, block right. If we're looking uh, in some of our board research, um, we uh, characterized uh, board capabilities, three different types of board capabilities. One was around defensive, which included cybersecurity. Another was around oversight, which were major transformation projects. And then the third was uh, strategic. And um, two of the three correlated with financial performance. So, and the two were strategic and uh, cyber. And, mm. and you'd got to get the cyber right first. Right, right. So does that apply to these sort of considerations and actually the framework as a whole, uh, as we think about oftentimes the examples we talk about, they are somehow digital uh, businesses where the products themselves are easily digitized. If you think about other kinds of, uh, of, of businesses that are more traditional in a sense, whether they're services or manufacturing, do you see you know, an, an entirely analogous uh, set of trends and opportunities or are there any differences? No, we do see um, analogous trends. So for instance, um, in the research that we have done to follow up on this, uh, we're looking at healthcare. So for instance, there's a healthcare firm um, in Texas uh, Christus Health. And Christus, while it may not call itself an ecosystem driver right now, um, they certainly are seeing the electronic health record as being a platform. And they have relationships with doctors. They talk about the services that they've got that are x-rays and dietitians and coaching. Uh, and they're putting it all together. They are the conduit through which, mm -hmm. so they're actually in many respects, putting together an ecosystem. Um, if you look at, the, we're also seeing combinations. So for instance, if you look at GE's Predix platform, what they are doing is putting sensors onto um, big turbines. I mean, the turbines are themselves physical, but the sensors are actually collecting the digital data. Mm -hmm. So it's really, they're creating a combination of both digital and physical. Um, if you look at Monsanto with uh, farming, um, they actually are quite digital. Again, with sensors, uh, with putting a sensor on the tractors, with putting sensors on the ground. They haven't gotten sensors to seeds yet, but I, that's probably uh, only a matter of time. And again, another combination of digital and physical. Um, mm -hmm. So we think that this is, uh, is really generalizable across all businesses. Mm -hmm. There uh, may be some smaller businesses um, where you're not trying to scale, where you're going to have very little digital component. You could see someone doing wealth uh, management where they want to have uh, very close face-to-face -face contact with their customers where um, the ecosystem just doesn't matter as much. Mm -hmm. So focusing on this question of sort of the ecosystem and quite often times we also use the word yourself platform mm -hmm. uh, and, and we often hear that being sort of the platform strategy for, uh, for these companies. Is, is, is that a similar model? or the It's a similar model but um, really we're talking about the platform more as a digitized platform that each company has to um, 
run their business on. Um, when I think about a platform business, I think really about uh, Google and Amazon. Mm. Um, I think that companies who want to be ecosystem drivers need to look at these large platform businesses to see how they're, um, how they've created that digitized platform that allows um, different kinds of companies, suppliers, partners, and uh, customers to come onto the platform. But mm -hmm. um, it's probably more than just a platform business because right. uh, I think a lot of these platform businesses are really looking at uh, being wholly digital. Whereas mm -hmm. we think uh, the exciting part happens when you're marrying the digital and the physical. Interesting, interesting. Uh, mo moving on, we, uh, a lot of people uh, are asking questions about what the competitive uh, implications of, of, of uh, these developments are. In particular, uh, if you're up in that top right corner, you've moved into being uh, an ecosystem player. Uh, is this a kind of a winner-takes-all market? Uh, if, if it sort of is, are there things that people that would like to get into those markets can think about doing to try to dislodge or disrupt the, the, the market leaders? Or if you're the market leader, what kind of things do you need to be doing to protect your position? Um, we're doing research on whether this is winner take all. I mean, the, the slide that I showed that showed the, the shrinking of the percentage of ecosystem drivers seems to suggest that there is an element of winner take all to this. However, uh, I think that a lot of industries have not got an ecosystem driver yet, that we're still destinations, but it is uh, quite likely that it is going to be, that's going to have a very strong element. After all, how many um, financial service ecosystem drivers do you want to have in your life? Mm -hmm. I mean, it, once you have your data on them, it's uh, hard to decide that, uh, that you're going to split it across uh, two different platforms. I mm -hmm. mean, that's something that you would have to keep track of as a customer. And what these ecosystem drivers are trying to do is make uh, the decision making and uh, the transactions mm -hmm. easier. And so we think that there is an element of the winner take all. Um, the other models can certainly be uh, profitable and you're not going to lose by buying options uh, to move toward an ecosystem driver. So everything that you do, such as creating a, a set of APIs that uh, make it easier for you to interact and partner uh, is not going to hurt your mm -hmm. business. Mm -hmm. um, also knowing more about your customer, you may end up in an omni-channel which uh, could be quite profitable. Mm -hmm. So um, really it's buying the options and it's really going, it's not just incremental improvement, you need to be rethinking the way that you're doing business and we don't see that as uh, you may not become an ecosystem driver, but moving toward it is certainly not going to hinder you. Do you think that moving in that direction uh, towards ecosystem driver is actually something that every business needs to be thinking about? Or can they carve out a niche for them as a, as a decision they may make to play in one of the other segments and that's where they're going to stay? They can actually carve out a niche. What you need to be careful with in the supplier especially is that uh, that can be, you want to make sure you have enough innovation there that you can continue to sell um, to other companies and that your product is desired um, because otherwise it, you could become the low cost producer mm. and, and the race to the bottom could be uh, a real challenge there. So, so if moving towards ecosystem uh, provider is perhaps the desirable uh, thing to be doing directionally. As you were uh, talking about that two by two, I drew a little sketch to myself with some arrows on it, trying to figure out how do you get from bottom left to top right, if you happen to be in the bottom left. And you know you can go up and then right, or right and then up, or take a series of small steps in both directions. Is there um, any advice on that? So I think what we see a lot of companies trying to do, and most of our case studies now, again, it, it's hard to find the ecosystem drivers. A lot of the case studies show moving up toward omni-channel and then making a move mm -hmm. um, toward the right. Um, I think stair steps is absolutely possible uh, to do. Uh, we haven't seen as many modular producers starting as a modular producer and then creating a platform. Um, PayPal may be trying to do that, but 
it's um, it's a payment system. It's a rather narrow product. And mm -hmm. what we haven't seen is a modular producer product that is actually so uh, encompassing that it actually could become the platform. Um, PayPal's making a shot at it, I mm -hmm. think, but I don't know that they've gotten there yet. Mm -hmm. So I think that moving to the um, to the right and then up might be a challenge. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of the examples that are easy to think about and uh, they, they come with this conversation that people might know more about or that seem to be the consumer-facing uh, ones. Uh, but presumably there's something uh, that's somewhat hidden uh, going on in the business-to-business -business markets as well. Uh, but are we saying the same thing and, and, and what does that look like? Slower. Um, actually a fair amount of opportunity we think in the business to business and what in the latest survey that we did we were uh, surprised to see that uh, business to business actually correlated with uh, market share so I think that that's a more fragmented market right now um, I think that there's a lot of opportunity there I think that we uh, the business to consumer is been what's talked about and in the news and is what um, really has engaged people's attention mm -hmm. and but I think that uh, we need to look more at business to business. It's uh, on our research um, uh, track this year. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned uh, change management mm -hmm. uh, towards the end of your, your opening remarks. And, and, and clearly, we're talking about an awful lot of change here, whether Absolutely. it's gradual and uh, in, in a staircase or, or more drastic. Uh, do you think that, uh, from, from the research that you're seeing, that companies and other organizations have the capabilities that they need to be able to drive and survive these kinds of transformational changes? And if, if they don't, what are the kind of things that they should be doing to try to build that capability? So uh, some do, some think about it, and some have really got um, a, a ongoing um, continual change built into the way that they do business. A lot of firms don't, and they're going to have to be thinking about uh, how do they build the capabilities inside? Do they hire people? Do they uh, get the right skills? Do they need to change the talent? Um, and then what are the kinds of programs that they can put into place internally? Um, I also know that externally they can um, go to programs and, uh, and really open up their worldview of what's going out um, and mm -hmm. learn from their fellow participants in these uh, executive education programs. Great, great. Well, uh, we'll get on and talk about that uh, now, perhaps, as we're just running out of uh, time for this segment of the presentation. Uh, we're about to move over to the Facebook Live. Um, maybe I can just ask you, you know, the one parting question uh, for this segment, this building off what we were just talking about. If there was one thing, one piece of advice that you'd give to people who are watching this, uh, this webinar that they can do uh, when you know when they get back to their office now or perhaps when they go into work tomorrow morning uh, that would help them to take a positive step based on, on on your research what would that one piece of advice be so I think the one piece of advice would be to um, to uh, evaluate your firm so look at the eight things that we said that you have to do to move up and to move to the right and seriously give a grade to yourself on each of those. You could do it easily um, using a one to six scale. Mm -hmm. uh, if you add them together, you'll get close to 50, double it and you'll see out of 100. Um, the great firms are over 70%. Great, well, thank you. Hopefully that's, uh, as we like to say at MIT, that's a real action that, uh, that, that people can take uh, right away. And so just, I'd, you know, I'd like to wrap up this segment by thanking you, uh, Stephanie, for, for this fascinating uh, presentation and discussion. Thank you for sticking around for the uh, Facebook live chat, which will be coming up in a moment. We hope many of you can, uh, can join us there as well. Uh, I did just want to mention before we finish this segment that Stephanie teaches in, uh, as she mentioned, one of our executive education programs, Revitalizing Your Digital Business Model, uh, and uh, also has provided us with uh, some uh, further uh, sort of reading and information that we will be circulating by email after the webinar. Now we're about to uh, wind up and move over to Facebook Live. Uh, so thank you uh, once again, everybody. Uh, and if uh, we could push uh, the Facebook Live link in a few moments, uh, we hope that you can all join us there. Once again, Stephanie, thank you very much.
Uh, and uh, the, on the last slide, we'll see some further readings, and we'll be sending out all these slides so people don't have to frantically write that down, um, but we'll send that information uh, out to you shortly. Thanks to all our participants for joining us today. This concludes our webcast. You may now disconnect. Have a great day.